My name is Tara Brabazon and I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to vlog 174. Boundaries. Boundaries. The doctoral space, the higher degree space, is a space of complaint. Students complain about supervisors, supervisors complain about students. And the nodes and the fonts of these complaints are varied. It can be about a lack of feedback, a lack of time spent in meetings, a lack of support, whatever that would mean, uh, the capacity to find work after the PhD is completed, assistance and support to write grants, the list goes on and on and on. And most of these complaints begin with a miscomprehension or a misunderstanding of the relationship between a PhD student and a PhD supervisor. So what are these assumptions that come into the doctoral space? And the problem is, team, that often these assumptions are unspoken assumptions from both sides. So this means that the supervision continues and the unmet expectations start to fester throughout the candidature. And without professional development, supervisors continue to supervise as they were supervised. And of course that would be a problem in any time and place, but universities have changed radically in the last 10 years, and to be frank, radically in the last two years. We can't do what we used to do because the context, the institution, has transformed. And of course students in a doctoral program are more diverse and they're greater in number than at any point in the history of higher education. So you can see the problem that's going on. We've got supervisors without teaching qualifications and without professional development supervising as they were supervised and yet we've never had more diverse students in terms of their sociology, in terms of their social background in any point in history. So we've got this diversity and they're just supervising in the same way for this diverse group of students. So you can see this is where the problem is emerging. It is indeed a disaster waiting to happen. So this is a vlog about how we avoid miscommunication, how we untangle those assumptions a bit and we understand those unmet expectations. So what I'm focusing on today is the notion of the boundary. How you put in place, how you actively create a boundary between you and your supervisor. Very clear boundaries so we know what's going on. Now this uh, vlog suggestion comes from a wonderful source, a, a very special source for me. I had a remarkable student called Colin, hi Colin, when I was teaching in Canada. He was a, a great scholar, it was my pleasure to teach him through his fourth year of his communication degree and he's gone on to great success and I'm terribly proud of Colin and I'm still in touch with him. He's a lovely, lovely man and very talented man too can I say and he currently has a partner who's enrolled in a PhD program and very early one morning, because obviously Canadian time, Adelaide time, Colin sent me a message and said look my partner is getting all these, he called them crazy, crazy bizarre expectations from his advisor supervisor in the North American system. Random emails at all sorts of times, almost being treated like a slave, having to be on 24-7 call. So could I do a vlog on the notion of boundaries, how we actually separate out what is okay for a supervisor to ask a student? And of course also for what's okay for a student to ask a supervisor. So that suggestion comes from Colin. I love that it's a partner of a PhD student that's asked that question. So Colin, as always, you are a brilliant man and a great advisor to me. So this one is for you and best of luck to your wonderful partner. I hope it all goes well. So let's do this. And in the vlog this week, I'm going to be really provocative. You're gonna probably disagree or be very challenged, affronted by a lot of what I talk about, but I'm doing that intentionally because I'm trying to shake you up because the nature of assumptions is we don't reflect on them. We don't think about those assumptions. We just sort of assume everybody agrees with us. Well, to be honest with you, let's probe and poke and prise open those assumptions today to put in place that border or that boundary. And this is important not only for you as a student right now, but many of you will go on very, very soon to be a supervisor of either your own PhD students or of staff in a private or public organisation. So you have to work out what you think 
about supervision, the supervision of staff as much as students. Work yourself out so you know where those boundaries are when you go forward to your next stage. Now let's just start with the basic stuff. Your supervisor is not your friend, not your partner, not your boyfriend, not your girlfriend, not your brother, not your sister, not your mother, not your dad, or your boss. Now sometimes your PhD supervisor will be your boss. So you'll be a demonstrator for them, you'll be a teaching assistant, you'll be a tutor. But that is a different relationship. So the first bit of advice I'd offer is, if, if you are working for them, so they are paying you from either soft or grant money, what you need to do is be very clear that that paid employment is constructed separately from your supervision. Don't blur them, keep them very separate. If it's of use to you, when I used to run 10, tutors for a large first year course, most of whom were my PhD students, we would have their individual supervision, but we would have a team meeting to talk about the teaching once a week. So we would do the teaching meeting in its own time and place, and I would treat them as colleagues, as professionals, as the teaching staff, and that was a different relationship from me as their supervisor in their own private meeting. So be very clear about what your supervisor is not. Your supervisor is your supervisor. Now, I'm not using the sort of Theresa May line there, Brexit means Brexit. Your supervisor is your supervisor, but through this vlog, we're going to unpick what the actual supervisory relationship is, whereas with Brexit, we still don't really know what it is. Similarly, a PhD student for your supervisor is not their slave. You're not their friend, boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, sister, brother, unpaid research assistant, cheap teacher, babysitter, or house cleaner. So you can see how we need to be very clear about these boundaries. We've talked about what the relationship is not. Now let's put some flesh and blood and bone into what the relationship is by configuring borders and boundaries. Now the first strategy I would offer to you in configuring that relationship and the borders around it is to use our student and supervisory charter at Flinders University. I'm very proud of a lot of the work we've done in the Office of Graduate Research at Flinders. I think probably I'm most proud of the supervisory charter that we've constructed. So for our students at Flinders University, put in you know, Flinders University supervisory charter into Google and up the document comes. And this document has columns for students and supervisors about their roles and their responsibilities. Very clear document. So if you're starting your higher degree, print that document out, first meeting, go through the roles and the responsibilities. If after this vlog today, you would like to reboot your current relationship, do the same thing. Print out that charter, sit down with your supervisor and sort this out. And for our wonderful friends around the world, and there are hundreds of thousands of you who watch these vlogs, do feel free, please, it's an open access, open source document to print out that Flinders University Supervisory Charter. You can remove the Flinders bit if you like and actually discuss that, use that as a discussion point to recommence your relationship with your supervisor or your advisor, depending on the system. And this is, I think, this charter is particularly important for our younger students. And I'm using younger intentionally there, not early career researchers. These are the younger students who move straight from high school into an undergraduate degree, into honours, into a higher degree. That was me, so I really understand that group. And the trouble is, not trouble, it can be a great gift as well, but the challenge is, Often your supervisor in that narrative is the person that taught you in, in first year. My first, I think, 15 PhD students completed, I taught them in first year, I taught them all the way through to their PhD. So that in many ways is the most challenging relationship to configure boundaries, particularly with the younger students, because this relationship must change. What occurs is you're in honours and you get first class honours because you're a brilliant student and then you move on into the PhD program and you think it is going to be the same. And can I just state to you as Dean, they are the most problematic supervisions that I see in my office within the first six months because the assumption is honours is the same as a PhD and actually you need to create the break. You need to create a brand new boundary and border to work out what this new relationship is. And so be avert, be clear, talk about as, as clearly as you can your assumptions, 
your expectations and to get your supervisor to do the same. What do you assume about this relationship? What are your expectations of me? Now the most important variable to discuss right at the start is authorship. So who writes what, who gets what, be clear. And I would print out the Australian Code of Research Conduct is really, really clear. Research integrity, very clear in this country. Authorship, very clear in this country. Makes me very proud of the work we've done in this country. And I'm about to, very shortly, finally do a vlog on authorship. So right at the start, be avert. So don't have festering expectations about if you do this, you'll get authorship be clear and again use the policy documents that we have in this country to enable that conversation okay so roles and responsibilities big stuff we've got that sorted great now we're going to granularize that relationship we're going to start to put in those boundaries your supervisor is not your friend full stop the relationship can be friendly. You'll notice the movement from a noun to an adverb. But don't make assumptions that your supervisor can manage any problems that emerge with your family, with your partner, or with your children. Don't make assumptions that they can manage your emotional problems. Always remember that your supervisors are people first. You can never know the personal problems and situations that your supervisor is confronting. And of course, they shouldn't, they mustn't share their personal situations with you. And you've often heard me say, we are the grown-ups in the relationship. And that means we have to often, you know, suck it up, princess. We often, if stuff's going on in our life, that's our private business. And we've got to try and not let that impact on you. And I'll use the most obvious example of that. So, for example, you know, my late, late husband was dying of pancreatic cancer. Not a single person at Flinders University knew about that because I'm a grown-up. I have to handle that. I have to manage that. And it was only at the point where he died where I informed our shared students that actually he had died. Because both of us, including Steve, was the grown-up in the relationship. So we just simply have to get on with that and do that work. So that's an extreme example, but I hope it makes the point. You need to remember, therefore, that, you know, if you're going, well, what's, what's he doing, or what's she doing, what's going on here with this person? You have no idea what's happening in their life, in the life of your supervisor. So don't put extreme demands on them, because also you don't know what they're going through, full stop. And you can never unsay what you've said, you can never undo what you've done. So supervision is crucial to the success of a PhD. There's no doubt about that. The difference between a student that finishes and a student that doesn't is the caliber of the supervision, full stop. The research shows that. But what I would advise is have low expectations. You know, I'm a low expectations kind of girl, but that's probably the wrong phrase. We need accurate representations of what this relationship is going to be, and that comes through boundaries. Be clear in your own mind before you even come to the supervision about what is absolutely crucial to you. What do you absolutely need your supervisor to do? What's, so what are the deal breakers for you? What, what do you need this person to do full stop? List them down, talk about it. If they can't deliver it, walk away early, right? Then have a second set where you go, what would be good or useful if this supervisor could provide that for me? Great, have that list. And then what is icing on the cake? What is absolutely tremendous if this person could do this for me? So the absolutely crucial elements in this story, you need to communicate to your supervisor right at the start and explain why. Every supervision is different. I always have worries and concerns with supervisors who supervise every student in the same way. So a forward system. That doesn't work with the diversity of our students. So supervisors need to understand you. They also need to listen. You tell us what's crucial and why it's crucial to you. And we can create a bespoke supervision to address those needs. So problems emerge, team, when you have expectations in your head and they're unexpressed. And then you expect your supervisor to guess what is important to you. We're a supervisor, not a mind reader. You're going to have to communicate 
what is important to you. So articulate what is important, what is useful or good, and what just is nice, what is just welcome to the relationship. So they're sort of the deal breakers. That's setting the scene of the big boundary at the start. Let's now be provocative, and I'm gonna raise five specific issues to provoke you so that we can start to unravel your assumptions a little bit and start to communicate them. And I want you to communicate these issues directly with your supervisor. So issue one, <laughs> mobile phones. Now I understand if you're in a wet lab, if you're off on field work, then a phone connection with your supervisor is absolutely crucial, absolutely crucial. But the overwhelming majority of students in a PhD program are not in a wet lab or on field work. My students have never and will never have my mobile phone number. And can I say my staff, the staff I work with also do not have my mobile phone number. And I made decisions about this a long, long time ago, really about 15 years ago as mobile phones started to be used in the workforce. Because I simply said to people, look, I'm not a drug dealer. I'm not a prostitute. Therefore, I don't need to be 24 seven on my mobile phone. Those of you that come into the Office of Graduate Research or have meetings with me via Skype know that nothing ever interrupts my relationship and my meeting with you. I'm not checking my phone. I don't even know where my phone is most of the time. If you're having an analog moment with me, you are my focus. I'm not being deflected to other people's stuff. So I don't have to take calls from clients because I'm not a drug dealer and I'm not a prostitute. So think about your relationship between privacy and your mobile phone. Do you really need your supervisor's mobile phone, really? And do they really need yours? Also, while I'm in the sort of digital bit, monitor your use of emails. And what I want you to start to do is regularize your relationship with your supervisor through when you send emails. So I make a really clear point about never sending emails after working hours. So what I'm trying to do is render all my relationships with my staff, with my students, with everybody, render all the relationships professional, normal, and regular. So whatever your supervisor decides to do, if your supervisor decides to send emails at 11.30 at night or 2 a.m. in the morning, that's their business. Don't follow them there. Don't follow them there. Maintain a regular work pattern. And trust me, no one needs to receive an email at 3 a.m. in the morning. I'm not sure why people do that. Remember, I'm up at 2. I wake up at 2. I do not send my first email till about 8.30, 9 o'clock in the morning to regularize the relationship. I'm there to do that work early in the morning. No one needs to hear from me at 4 a.m. in the morning. That's ridiculous. I'm not sure why people do that. Are they showing off that they're up and they're, they're, they're needing other people to see that they're working? I don't know, that's not my business. But if people are sending emails early in the morning or late at night, don't follow them there. This is a workplace, start to regularize it. Two, formality of meetings. As we discussed in the vlog last week, research is emotional work. There's no doubt about that. And it is an emotional relationship between your supervisor and your student. And that emotional relationship must have limitations. It must have boundaries. Now, I run my weekly meetings with my students with a fair amount of formality. They are scheduled. We have clear ideas and topics to address each week. I do not have coffee with my students. I do not run meetings in coffee shops with my students. Those meetings are in my office and my office door is open. Because this is not a private conversation. This is a professional conversation. It can be formal, yes it can be friendly, not friends, friendly, but there should be nothing that private that it requires that the door is closed because issues are addressed in real time. So if a student is having an emotional issue, address it early so that it's not festering and it's simply sort of like a horror movie. 
If there's a problem, talk about it in real time. And that's why you have weekly meetings. Yes, we as supervisors manage emotional issues. We absolutely do. But part of the boundary work that I'm talking about today is a supervisor is not a trained counsellor. A supervisor is not a social worker. That's important. Our role is to keep you moving down the pathway through your candidature to graduation. So we are also, if you will, pointers or agents for other facilities in the university. So we connect you with our wonderful librarians or statisticians or indeed counsellors. So this is our expertise and we point you to the professionals to enable further development. Supervisors are not gods. We are experts in particular research areas and if we have teaching qualifications, we hopefully have the andragogy that allows you to be scaffolded to graduation. But there are boundaries and limitations in who we are and what we do and our expertise. So the best of supervision has those clear boundaries around form and content. Three, crucially, all supervision is cross-cultural supervision. The greater the difference between student and supervisor socially, the greater the risk of miscommunication. An array of differences exist between students and supervisors. So age, nationality, religion, politics, sexuality, gender, and Sandy, hi Sandy. I'm very aware of the specificity of the trans community in this conversation. I think I'm gonna do a, a specific bespoke blog on this matter because the trans community in particular, you know, the miscommunication that can emerge around that area is increasing and problematic and concerns me and I think requires its own specific engagement and Sandy I'm going to do that we'll do that together so much of university life is based on homology because supervisors don't have teaching qualifications they simply supervise as they were supervised they teach as they were taught so experience substitutes for supervision and it also substitutes for expertise and professional development so the greater the difference between students and supervisors, the more damaging this experiential homological model is. Supervision is not about replacing ourselves, training the next generation to be identical to us. It's not about that. It's about enabling students to develop their own project in their own way to become their own best selves. So find strategies to communicate your identity your differences and build bridges through language to your supervisor's identity and differences. Four, social media. Now you have to make decisions about social media. Now I'm very, very comfortable with social media and my PhD students. Now, most supervisors, from the training that I do, most supervisors are not, and that's absolutely cool. That's about boundaries and decisions. But that's because I maintain professional and very decent engagements on Facebook, for example. I'm not doing anything weird that I'm worried that my father is seeing, my mother is seeing, or my boss is seeing. I'm not sort of drunk in a gutter going, yeah, selfie, boom, yeah. I I'm not doing that. I have ethical, I hope, kind, compassionate, relationships on Facebook, so I'm not worried who sees it. And can I say, my 89-year-old mother, my 91-year-old father, and my fabulous boss, Rob Saint, are friends of mine on Facebook. <laughs> so that shows you I'm very comfortable with that, but that's because I have a very big private sphere, and the privacy that I convey on Facebook is a regular, regularised and regulated private space, if you will. Now, if you have a problem, and most of you probably will have a problem with social media, then draw a hard line to separate yourself from your supervisor and do it overtly. So decide what is appropriate. So and make this decision on your perspective first before you even deal with your supervisor. What makes you comfortable? So would you be comfortable to engage with your supervisor on LinkedIn and Twitter? Perhaps, if that's the case, write that down. Maybe Pinterest maybe Facebook, maybe Instagram, you decide where that boundary is, then you must 
communicate that to your supervisor and they may have and probably will have completely different borders and boundaries to you. And actually, the supervisor's level of tolerance is the one that will predominate. So if they just say, look, the greatest respect, LinkedIn is fine because that's a professional organisation. The rest, I, I won't actually have you as a friend or a follower. Okay, so that's all fine, but you're going to have to negotiate that. But you work out your level of comfort first, then communicate that to your supervisor. A lot of supervisors are not worried at all. I'm not worried at all because I self-actualize and self-manage. So I say, that's fine. If you want to be a friend of mine on Facebook, that's great. That's your choice. I'm comfortable. Okay, but talk about it. Five, oh yes, social engagements. Problems emerge when social gatherings occur between students and supervisors. They can be at Christmas parties, they can happen when you go to the pub after a seminar. There is a tendency for a group of students to have a social event with a supervisor and they were the great old days that some people are still in. But after Respect Now Always and after the Me Too movement, to be frank with you, this is just not on anymore. This really does need to stop. I don't have social engagements with my students ever. I don't drink with them. I don't have meals with them. I don't have Christmas parties with them. And can I say, I also have the same rule with my staff in the Office of Graduate Research. You all know how much I adore the wonderful staff in the Office of Graduate Research but I don't mix with them socially. And the reason for that, and I will articulate it, I'm talking about communication today, is out of respect for them. I don't want them ever to feel pressured about their behavior or have any complications or problems in and around their family because I respect the boundaries of work and leisure. I believe very strongly in leisure. It's a word we're not using a lot in the current age, but it means a lot to me, and I respect those boundaries. I respect the work and family division. Remember, your supervisor is not your friend, is not your friend. It is not a social relationship. It is an intellectual and a teaching relationship. And by the way, if you'd like to see that relationship, a few vlogs ago, I did a vlog with Dr. Leanne McRae who was my PhD student, well, you know, 15 years ago. And we have a very close relationship. But as you can see, it, it's a complicated relationship. And you actually saw it in the camera. It, it is incredibly friendly, uh, but, it, but it's so much more than a friendship. It's, it's deep and it's layered and it's complex. And it's been over a long period of time. So you can actually see that that supervisory student relationship 15 years on looks very different from a friendship. So have a look and a think about that again. So I really would, as a student, as a supervisor, maintain a lot of control over where the supervisor and the students mix and meet. And wherever there is alcohol, I would avoid that location, full stop. Remember, always remember, there is a power differential between you and your supervisor. He or she holds power over you. They hold power over you. And if you can manage the relationship and those borders effectively, they will write a reference for you for the next 20 or 30 years. So this really matters. So I would keep the relationship kind, respectful, professional. It can be close, but know where those boundaries are and make sure those boundaries are very clearly expressed to your supervisor. Odd things happen in three years. Students make mistakes, supervisors make mistakes. It's, it is a volatile relationship, a stressful relationship, but it is a professional relationship. So keep it calm as much as you can. Eva Peterson described postgraduate research supervision as, quote, boundary work. I love that. So the whole point of supervision is boundary work. Love it. Identities are being formed. Identities are being changed. And those boundaries will alter through the candidature. So at the start of your supervision, your supervisor is the expert in the field. 
but about 18 months in, that expertise starts to shift, right? And so that changes the relationship as well. The knowledge base changes the personal relationship. And at year three, you, the student, you are the expert. Therefore, the boundaries must change. So keep that relationship dynamic and agile, but also honest and know where the boundaries are and know when they move and where they settle. So Colin, you're an amazing human, love working with you. You were great to teach, so proud of all the work that you've done and thank you for the suggestion. My respects to your partner and I wish you love, light and peace. Tea out.